Right. Thank you for coming again to the interactive Bible studies. Uh, this is our ninth week now that we've been looking at uh, prayers or uh, with a particular question what is prayers and uh, so what is prayers is what we've been looking at for the past nine weeks and uh, tonight so what we've been doing in each of those sections of what is prayer is that we are also using it as uh, a means of uh, identifying the different types of prayers and uh, we've looked at different types so you need to look into the social media particularly youtube for a kind of uh, uh, the listing of the different uh, recordings and as i was saying before uh, some of it now, if you if you don't have any questions, uh, the questions will still give room for questions even after the recording has been done so that we can always review it and uh, you can always send in your questions uh, by email or by text so that we can still answer it in any type of the prayer topic that we have looked at. And um, tonight we are looking at... Uh, uh, another type of prayer uh, in our series of what is prayer part 9 we're looking at uh, prayer of dedication prayer of dedication or consecration and along the line you will see you will still find that the name also I can refer to it as a prayer of uh, abandonment or I would say prayer of surrender surrender Surrendering to God, your will, your purpose, your uh, your ambition, everything. So it's a very important prayer type. So prayer of dedication or prayer of consecration or if you want to say prayer of surrender. So dedication to, the, to divine service, dedication to God's service, dedication to God for a life, of divine service or ordination to the office of say an apostle a prophet a pastor evangelist or teacher or we don't call them teacher just a minister of god so that is also uh, this kind of prayer or prayer of ordination to be a bishop in 2 timothy chapter 1 2 Timothy chapter 1, the one we're starting with tonight, was uh, the reference made by Apostle Paul to Timothy, his uh, spiritual son. He said in verse 2, to Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without season, I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. Verse 5, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Louise, and your mother, Eunice, and I'm persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So a quick reminder to Timothy to stir up uh, the gift of God in him through uh, the laying on of the hand of uh, uh, Paul. And that's when Paul prayed the prayer of consecration for Timothy into the into divine service. So we all need to stir up the gifts of God. That word stir up is like fanning up uh, the, the, the coal of fire. When, when it is fanned up, it's the, 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 the fire rekindled. And so 
He's saying here that we need to stir up the gift of God in us to propel us further and further with God. So what is the prayer of consecration? It is the prayer of dedication to God or abandonment. And in such case, you trust God absolutely and completely in such scenario. And Matthew 26, Jesus Christ also showed us uh, this type of uh, prayer when he was in the garden uh, of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, I read from verses 36 to 38. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. The purpose of this type of prayer is, as it says, to surrender one's will. To surrender one's will even to God. It's like coming to one's wit's end and you don't, you've done everything you know how to do and all to no avail. Then you find out that this is the time for me to say, Lord, I'm not wrestling with you. I want to submit everything to you. The point at which you have exhausted all your ideas and effort and it appears that uh, uh, nothing is, is, is really happening. So look at verse uh, 39. Jesus Christ, he went on, verse 39, he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. So this is uh, at the point when one has been wrestling, has been wrestling with God against the will of God. But now you are ready. You know, he said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So the prayer of dedication or the prayer of consecration, in my own view, is prayed by those who already have a lived experience. They have a lived of experience God. of God. Look at verse 40 to 40, 44. Then he came to his disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. So you see a man wrestling with God, back and forth. You know, that this kind of prayer is to surrender one's will. And uh, when one surrender, one's will, eventually, that's the signing off of your own rights or human right to God. And look at uh, uh, verse 45 to 46. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. 
So you could see that uh, he, he, he eventually surrender his will to God. He signed it off. Therefore, it is not for everyone, I believe, this kind of prayer, but for some more than others. How do you know when this type of prayer is the right one for you? I believe just like any other type of, um, of prayer, you will know because once you pray this kind of prayer, there is a kind of serenity or peace of mind that you enjoy in life and uh, in your purpose. Especially when you know that you've given up your your right to God. So there's this, it comes with an absolute uh, serenity and peace in your mind. You know? um, Naomi, in the Bible, as we know, became a widow and uh, also at the same time lost her two grown-up sons. But already at that time, the sons are married, were married, with wives but no children so but all this problem happened to them in a foreign land in Ruth chapter 1 that's where we see the uh, the the example in Ruth chapter 1 from verses 6 to 8 then she arose with her daughter in law, daughters in law, talking about uh, Naomi, that she might return from the country of Moab. But she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. So you see, this woman, after the uh, loss of the husband and the two sons, the Bible says she arose to return to her own country. And verse 7. Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Verse 8 And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Verses 11 to 14. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters, why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope. If I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, will you wait for them till they were grown? Will you restrain yourself from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Usually, it appears when one is pushed in a way to that point whereby you offer this kind of prayer of consecration to God. Remember, you are at your wit's end. But it appears at that time that uh, one can say, because we are limited by what we can see, well, unbeknownst to uh, Naomi at this time, that God was actually in control of a situation despite the negativity that surrounded her at the time. And look at verse 14. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Opa, one of the daughters-in-law, kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Ruth clung to her. So remember that the prayers of um, dedication or consecration is the prayer of surrender. That I said, you surrender your, your ambition, your will to God. You surrender absolutely your rights your human right to God in a practical way. I believe it is only, it's not for everyone, it's only meant for those who are called to take a decision 
of a life-changing type, especially those who are called to be ministers of God. Verse 15 to 18. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to our people and to our gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, now this is where I saw the prayer of consecration. Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Naomi already had shown that prayer of consecration when she said in verse 6 that she wanted to return back to her home, homeland. That was a decision she, she was kind of forced to take because what brought her to the foreign land was no longer there. And so the best thing to do was to make that decision of a life-changing, a life-changing decision that will impart on the rest of our life. But now in this case, it's going to also impart on those two uh, young women that were left behind. So it was not only uh, Naomi that made that prayer of consecration to God. Also, we could see here in verse 16 about Ruth, one of the daughters-in-law, that says to her mother-in-law, and treat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. To me, this is that kind of a prayer of surrender. You surrender, she's surrendering her own plan in life, her own purpose in life to God. You see, but it was Naomi that influenced her decision to do that. She must have seen the the God life in a mother-in-law that has over the years uh, uh, impressed her and imprinted on her heart to make up her mind on this kind of decision. So where for wherever you go, she continue, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. That is it. You can see abandoning everything to God, absolute trust in God. And this is that determination. And I believe you saw the determination in this kind of prayer and a sense of purpose to serve the living God. The prayer of dedication and consecration. Again, there was... There was uh, a decree at Shushan where the citadel, the palace of King Hasu Asurios, was, who ruled over 120 provinces from India to Ethiopia. I'm referring to the book of Esther. The decree was punitive and vengeful and in fact genocidal because uh, it was a decree to exterminate the Jews that were, that, that, that were at Shushan at that time. And uh, the name Esther was the Persian name that was given to this Hebrew woman, the queen of the king at the time who was a Jew and her Hebrew name was Adasa. Adasa when I check the meaning means Matthew. Matthew that is uh, a kind of an evergreen shrub or plant and uh, we're going to see the importance of this Matthew of a name given to this queen at the time that a decree, an evil decree, was given to kill our type of people. Uh, when something is evergreen, it means that uh, it is enduring. 
it remains fresh year in year out and our name Adassa was instrumental to how the decree to exterminate all the Jews at Shoshan at that time how that name eventually overturned the decree in Esther chapter 3 Esther chapter 3 we see there what's the reference that I was making from verse 8 to 11 then Haman said to King Asuros there's a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom their laws are different from all other peoples and they do not keep the king's laws therefore it is not fitting for the king king to let them remain so this was the accusation uh, that Amman was trying to bring against uh, uh, to justify his reason to kill these Jews verse 9 if it pleases the king let a decree be written that they be destroyed and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. So the king took, the, took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hama Amidatha, the Agagites, the enemy of the Jews, the enemy of the Jews verse uh, 11 and the king said to Ammon, Haman the money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you you can see the decree was now set in place this is what is called the genocide to exterminate the, the Jews but then see what Adassa how I said the name of Adassa, which is evergreen or uh, enduring, how that name uh, actually uh, played out in overturning the decree that has just been uh, issued. Look at chapter 4. Then we're going to see the role of uh, uh, the prayer of consecration, the role of prayer of uh, surrendering to the will of God how this also comes to play chapter 4 verse 6 to 12 so at church or attach went out to Mordecai, Mordecai in the city square that was in the front of the king's gate that's one of the servants of uh, uh, Esther, Esther verse 8 and Mordecai told him all that had that had happened to him Mordecai was the uncle of Esther now Mordecai was not has nothing to do with them uh, reality but he was at the gate of the king and so being a Jew he, he got he was privy of the uh, news of genocide against the Jews and of course because the queen also was a Jew but she was not aware of it so it was Mordecai the uncle that came to inform her but let's see her reaction and particularly the prayer of consecration that we are trying to so, establish uh, verse 7 and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Ammon had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. 10,000 talent of silver, remember. Verse um, 8. He also gave him, gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him, and plead before him for our people that was the expectation of uh, uh, Mordecai and then we continue verse 9 
So attach attach returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Attach and gave him a command for Mordecai. Verse 11. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman, look, you hear that? Everyone knows that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, who has not been invited, he has but one law, put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So that was the excuse of Esther trying to say that, you know that I cannot just go before the king if I'm not invited. You see? But then, what then happened? The prayer of consecration, I believe, is prayed by those who has lived experience of God. Remember, I've said that earlier on. Because they are going to take steps, some steps, which might put their lives at risk in order for them to defend others. That's what I was saying in everyone that has prayed this prayer of consecration or dedication to God. It's not even about themselves per se. They are fighting to protect the lives and the good of all. So, but talking about them that prayed that prayer, they forget about their own lives. They put their own lives uh, at risk just to save others. So they put their own neck on the line, so to say. And uh, we will see that also in the life of we have seen that in the life of jesus and uh we have seen that also in the life of uh uh naomi and ruth you know which what which eventually uh led to the improvement in the life of uh uh ruth because we didn't finish that story but that led to her getting to the end and then she was able to taste what purpose God asked for her. So in other words, because of the risk that is involved there, and because of the fact that they forget about themselves, the people praying, they are thinking more about the good of all, God always have a higher plan for them at the end. That's why I believe that the prayer of consecration, or the prayer of dedication, or the prayer of abandonment, or surrender of surren surrendering of your will to God is not for everyone, but it's for some people more than for others. And you could see at the end, Esther was not the only one who prayed the prayer of uh, of consecration to God. Men and women of of Jew were also involved. Look at verse thirteen, from verse thirteen to seventeen. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther. So after Esther has uh, carefully and craftily wanted to cook up or cooked up excuse for her not wanting to put her neck in the line for uh, for the Jews, hear what uh, the response of Mordecai. And Mordecai verse 13 told them to answer esther do not think in your own heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other jews for if you remain completely silent at this time relief and deliverance will arise for the jews from another place but you and your father's house will perish yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Something has happened in Esther now. Verse 16 to 17. Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. 
neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My mates and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. As you can know, if they are just fasting, uh, that would just be uh, uh, going on hunger strike. But this fasting was with prayer. And this is my own understanding of that prayer of consecration. Prayer of surrendering one's will to the will of God. This is the this is the prayer that puts your own lives, you see, at risk, so that but for the good of others. But this risk that you're talking about is your total trust in God to do the will of God for the good of uh, all. And look at the result of the prayer, chapter 7. I read quickly from verses 1 to 5. So the king and Ammon went to uh, die with Queen Esther. Haman was the one that orchestrated the coup. And on the second day, at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Up to the half the kingdom, it shall be done. And that's the straw that broke the camel's back. Verse 3. Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight. See, that's the favor that she was that made her to pray in the first place. Because she knew that no one can go to the king uh, without being invited. And so you could see that eventually when they prayed and fasted, that favor came in the form of uh, the king now making that request to Esther, ask me. Then Queen Esther answered and said, verse 3, If I found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. And this is the first time that it will dawn on the king the, 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 the decree that Haman has, uh, uh, in a way, instigated the king to issue verse 4. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So the king Hasuros answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he? Who will dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And this is where the coin was flipped. And look at verse 10 to cut the story short. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. So you could see at the end of the day, it paid off that prayer of Mordecai, the prayer of Esther, and the rest of the Jews. When they fasted, that was when they put their own neck on the line and their lives at risk. So he said, if I perish, I perish. So for a man or a woman to get to that level, of trust in God, he or she has abandoned his right to God. But there's then there's this presence of uh, serenity and peace of mind for that action that he or she has taken. In other words, what I'm saying to you is that when God leads you to make that prayer of dedication and consecration to God. Is to me is a higher call, and this is a type of prayer we pray, even at baby dedication, you know, or house de dedication, uh, or you bought it, or you have you bought an automobile, a car, 
you dedicate it to God. That's that kind of prayer that will that will pray to completely abandon that thing or that child or whatever you are dedicating to God into the hands of God. And that involves a lot of trust in God. And that's why I'm, I, I meant that I, I meant when I say that such people that pray that kind of prayer are praying it because of their lived experience of God. Um, last one, let me look at uh, dedication of John the Baptist. And that's in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, we see that in verse 59 to 60. Luke chapter 1, 59 to 60. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. His mother answered and said, No, it shall be called John. You know the reason for that, why it was called John, because that was the name that God gave to him even before he was born. Okay, verse 67 to 69. Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And then flip over to verse 76 to 80 to show us that prayer of dedication because you could see that this man was influenced by the Holy Spirit in the place of prayer and he prophesied with the help of the Holy Spirit. Verse, 40, verse 76, and you, so he was now prophesying to his son, John, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, which, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day of his manifestation to Israel. So you can see he was dedicated to God and consecrated to God. So this prayer is the start of a transforming life journey in the man's life as we have seen in the life of John the Baptist and even our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and uh, over the nation of uh, Israel going back the memory lane you saw even the life of Naomi and Ruth you know and uh, other people that we have discussed tonight, including uh, uh, Esther and Mordecai and uh, the other people that uh, stick their neck out and stood in the gap for uh, others to be protected. So maybe you are out there and uh, you've heard the call of God and then you're wondering how to start. And this is the kind of prayer that you will pray to commit that journey of a lifetime change into the hands of God. And there will be an accompanying, accompanying serenity and peace of mind once that prayer has been prayed as a mark of sign of support that uh, God has led you to do that. Amen, amen, amen. Well, that is the end of it. I believe that it makes sense to you. And uh, this is a time for us to 
uh, ask question if you have praise any. the lord Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, I, I have few questions sir some of them my sounds <laughs> My, my, my first question is, um, this prayer of dedication, I mean, prayer of dedication, ordination, consecration, in a way, can we, can I say, no, we, can I say it kind of relates, it's kind of like a, a prayer of um, losing hope. Like, you know, when, when Jesus prayed that prayer, you know, uh, before, before his death, it sounds it sounds to me like Jesus was was um, I won't say he was losing hope, but he was kind of you know kind of like worry about what's going to happen to him on the cross. You know when he was asking if this cup can be taken over from him, and also when um, I think, I believe it's Ruth and uh, Naomi. You know it sounds more to me it sounds more like a prayer of you know, desperation, I'm, I'm desperate, you know, they, I'm losing hope, so I need to make this kind of prayer. I don't know if I'm right, sir. I believe we should, we cannot pray, there's no prayer that is prayer of losing hope. There's a prayer of gaining hope or strengthening hope. So you can, there's no prayer that you pray of losing hope. But what happened there is the fact that of course, is a prayer kind of a prayer that you pray when you are at your wit's end, you know? Desperate. You see that you, it's not desperate, you are at your wit's end. Wit's end means that you have tried everything you know how to do, but all to no avail. You still, you, still not, you now want God to help you, you know? You now want God to help you that, Lord, and of course, before one can pray that prayer, of that, it's not only that you have come to your wit's end. Remember, I said it's also f not for everyone, but it's for some people that they already have a lived experience of God. So it's it's as if they know that this is what God said I should do. But Lord, can I? Can we look at it again? so that you can uh, consider another way by which I can go yeah. through this thing, you see? So yeah. that's why I said it's not for everyone, it's for people that really know what the will of God is, but at the same time, because of the humanity of themselves, the weakness of their flesh, they are also considering that this choice that God said I should go through is tortuous, it's painful it's not convenient lord can i get something more subtle can i get something that is less com that is less stressful but at the same time you see it's negotiating it's bargaining with god it took jesus christ about three times to continue to go back and forth to bargain not that he was uh, he didn't know what the will of god is he knew what the will of God is. The humanity of his divinity knew what the will of God is. But the humanity of that divinity needs to, is the one that is going to go through the pain. And he, he, he could foresee the pain. And so it could happen to you and I as well, trying to say, God, um, it, it's not my will, but let you eventually. Is it possible, rather? Is it possible if this cup can, can, can pass? Lord, but uh, but not my will, but Lord, let your will be done. See, that is the how that uh, prayer comes into play. And eventually when one now uh, uh, finally say, okay, Lord, I abandon my own right for your will to be done. That is that associated serenity of and peace of mind that comes, that's assures you that you have done the right thing and then you move on with god from there to the next level so it's not a prayer that you have abandoned hope it's not a prayer that you are praying when you are uh, hopeless you want should not be hopeless you cannot be hopeless in god at all 
hopeless you must not be you see because the reason why we're serving god is the god we're serving is the god of hope so there's no one that will be serving the god of hope that will be hopeless when we're talking about jesus the death it might not be it might not relate to what we're saying but when jesus died on the cross you know you say that that was the humanity of christ the the human part of him that died on the cross is it mm. like when he died on the cross he, i mean he died as a man on the cross not as not as god because god can god die. God cannot die. Of course, he's talking about his humanity. Because all along, yeah. they've been sacrificing animals, the blood of bulls and goats, to appease God. But this is the first time that even the blood of his son, Jesus, will be the, that has been decreed to be the uh, Lamb of God, will be offered for the sin of the whole world. So it was the it was Jesus born uh, as I mean Jesus walking on the on the on the face of the earth, you know. At the same time, the Son of God. So it takes the Son of God that came in the form of man to die as the atoning sacrifice for the sin of the world. Question size about. Um when John the Baptist was dedicated, you know, um, because like we know that you don't do baptism for children. So he was dedicated. So my question is, can an adult be dedicated? When you say dedicated, is this, it's not baptism. It's not like, no, it's not when baptism, you say dedicated, it. it was dedicated, Is this is the example of... Uh, uh when a child is born right yeah. a child is born it is the the right thing to do if you are a believing parent is to celebrate the arrival of that child right usually we do that on the eighth day following the jewish tradition and when we do that we also use that as an occasion to dedicate. In fact, that's the primary reason what we do on the eighth day. It's called dedication. So that day was following after uh, this, uh, the, the similitude of what they did for John the Baptist. And we're still doing it up to today. So that the eighth day, we now use it to dedicate that child or children to God. So... It's, it will be done, it will be better to have done it while the child was born. But if paraventure you now have an adult who came from a pagan background and now have found out about the God of Israel. So what that person and now believed, just like Acts chapter 8, when you heard about Simon the sorcerer and other people what i'm saying in effect is that as an adult of course you can dedicate an adult to the lord and that adult once uh, will become dedicated to the lord when he or she believed in christ and accept christ as lord and savior so his own dedication is when he or she becomes born again and torn from sin and so we present him or her to God. So that is dedication. We dedicate him or her to God. Yes, we can dedicate an adult at the point of them accepting the Lord as Savior. That uh, dedication of an adult is different from baptizing that adult when he became when he becomes a believer. Adults now that came from a pagan background when he or she that used to be a pagan now a pagan rather pagan background you see when he or she that used to be a pagan now accepts the lord as savior so something has happened in him or her he or she has now become born again so that yeah. 
accepting Christ as Lord and Savior, that is his own dedication. That is his own dedication to the Lord, that from today, I give my heart to the Lord, and I will follow you. That is dedication on his own. And that is what happens when we become born again. We become consecrated to God. You see, we become consecrated to serve God. But that's one form of uh, consecration. And then the other form of consecration that happens at another decision point or stage in one's life. Take, for instance, when now when one is called to be a minister, you see, and then he or she now accepted that call to higher service at the point of ordination. That is also a prayer of consecration that they will pray for him or her. The prayer of dedication or consecration from what you have heard tonight. In a nutshell. Prayer of surrender to the will of God. Um, like when we're praying and we see that all efforts, all our effort has been in vain and nothing to do anymore. We just surrender everything for the will of God to be done concerning a situation. It's not that your effort has been in vain, but what happened is that your effort to thwart that situation has not been uh, accepted by God as the solution to that problem. He sees it, but it's not accepted. That's not how God wants to resolve that matter. So it's not that your effort were in vain, but it's just that that is not the plan of God to get to the root of that problem for you at the time. And the people that are concerned knows that, yes, this is not what God wants me to do to get to the root of this problem. But God, can you help me to do it in a different way? God said, no, this is what I want to do. But because it's not that convenient, it's a price to pay. And because of that huge price to pay, people try to pray that God, can we do it another way? But God said, that is what I want to do. And that was the uh, negotiation between Christ and his father at that, at that prayer of uh, Jessamine. Because he knew that once the betrayer comes, see and uh, they arrest him that is there's no going back there's no turning back from that so he was praying that perhaps his father will let this cup pass in another way you know but at the end of the day he said okay lord it's not my will but let your will be done but he always said if possible you will see if possible let this cup pass See, so for such people that are praying that prayer of consecration or prayer of dedication, they know what the Father wants them to do. But they could sense also the, 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 the pain in the offering, the pain. They could, set, they could sense it. And so the humanity, the, 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 the frailty of the human condition steps in but at the same time is still in control of god's will because such person is still praying that god i want your will to be done so they have a lived experience of god and so they know that this is god asking me to do this and at the end of the day i have no choice but to do it Yes, any other person, what is the prayer of consecration? Let's hear it from Mars or some other person. Yeah? I, I also believe it's um, a prayer where it shows your maturity in your relationship with God. You know, because like you said earlier on, it's not just a prayer anyone can just make. You have to have a, 
you have you must have built a relationship with God to get to that stage where you know okay what you're praying about despite the fact that you know it might not be the will of God but you are you're willing to change and go according to the will of God despite the fact that Jesus knew that okay this thing I'm going through <laughs> wherever happen I'll definitely go through it but it's trying to like you said trying to bargain with God so you must have got to a stage in your life where your relationship with God is, is, is special. You know, it's not for a new believer or a new Christian. This is for someone who, who is, you know, who is, I mean, close to God and know how God works in their life. I mean, when you look at the lives of um, people like Esther and Mordecai, see, they, 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 there was no Jesus to them at the time, yeah. but they had a relationship with God. They had yeah. other ways by which they trusted God to that point that they know that they can put their lives, everything on the line, right? And so they did say, if I perish, I perish. I'm about to take this risk to protect the rest of the Jews. And it's, it's a price worth paying. Was that not what Jesus Christ did for us as well? It's a price worth paying. You see? And so, that's what I believe, why I, I said that this sort of prayer is for people that have a lived experience of God to that point that they know without a shadow of a doubt what the will of God is and they want the will of God to be done in their lives you see and that is why they prayed that prayer secondly what makes this type of prayer to stand out in your own ex experience what do you think make this kind of prayer the prayer of dedication prayer of consecration prayer of abandonment prayer of surrender what do you think make this prayer to stand out among every other type of prayer yes i think one of the things that makes it special it's one knowing god's will Knowing God's will and, and you just surrendering to that will fills you with so much joy, even in the midst of the pain, if that makes sense. Because if you don't surrender, then your life will be a tussle. It's like a struggle. You know, there's no peace because you're not doing it God's way. So to pray a prayer of surrender, you need to know God's will. We need to know that he's got the best in plan for us, the best plan for us. Even when we cannot see it physically, we have to see it in our hearts because he said so and he's faithful. So I think one of the, for me, I think uh, just knowing that I'm doing it God's way, I'm pleasing God and uh, it may not make sense to me now, it may be painful now, but at the end of the day, you know, it's all going to make sense. You know, like Jesus endured that cross because of the joy that was set before him. So you get this joy in doing God's will, even though your circumstances at the moment may be painful. So surrendering yourself and your life to that will, you know, it's just, it gives you joy, it gives you peace. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> We we'll soon realize that um, convenience and pleasure might not be the best attraction to knowing that something is of God. At times, it will be it will not be convenient what God said we should do. It might not be pleasurable 
what God said we should do. But then, we know this is what God say we should do. And I have to do it. It wasn't convenient for Ruth or Naomi rather to make a U-turn from a land that she found herself, foreign land, greener pasture, to now return back to her own home country because she now knows that God has begun to visit his, his people there. It wasn't convenient for the young ladies, Opa and uh, Ruth, to want to say they want to follow this old uh, mother-in-law. But eventually, when the reality dawned on one of them, she said, no, I have to go back to my people. But then I'm not going again with this mother-in-law. But what about Ruth? The Bible says clung with, with, with Naomi. She must have seen the God in the life of Naomi over the years that has impressed on her heart that, no, this God of Naomi, I will follow. And when the right time came, that's what Ruth did. And when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she left her alone. So what made those people to stand out was not because all along things have been convenient, but even when things are not convenient, they are okay with it because they can see God there. So when God is looking for a man, you and I, He's looking for people that will have the same lived experience. More so in the new covenant, we have a better experience of God because of Christ. But is that what we find today? Are we finding people that will put their neck on the line for others? Are we finding people that will put their own lives at risk to protect the good of all the good of all i will find people that are reaching out to preach even the in, in the midst of storm ordinary snow if there's snow you find that people will say they don't want to go out because they, people fall down on the floor they don't want to go out to preach to anyone they don't want to even go out to church you know even lockdown is an example now Many people, is it encouraging them to be faithful to God, in service to God? So that is what I'm saying, that that lived experience of God, we have to uh, uh, get it at one point or the other if we want to go far, far with God, anyone. So, and that to me is what makes this type of prayer to stand out from the other different types of prayer that we've been talking about because we all agree that this type of prayer is not for everyone it's for some people more than the others why can't it be you and the third one that i will want us to think about which i will not delve into now is abraham i believe abraham also fit into the sort of people that prayed this kind of dedication or consecrated prayer and you have to discuss with me do you agree with that then you see a man that as a pagan or a pagan left his uh, father left his father's house into a land that i will show you i believe there is dedication there. There is abandonment of his own will and purpose for the sake of the things that God says he should do. I see a man there that lived with God, have an ex a lived experience with God, so that it took him that years, 25 years, to get the promised child. And then once the promised child came and grew up to a young uh, a boy, God now said, go and sacrifice that one 
So I believe that there's something in Abraham that made him to want to do that because of that lived experience with God. You know, he still believed in God. You know, that even if this child is killed, God can raise this child from from, from the dead. So you are going to, you are going to look at other example if you can if you can agree with me that at at what point did Abraham pray that kind of a prayer? Can we really find a time in Abraham's life that he also prayed that prayer of dedication, that prayer of consecration in his entire life? Amen. All right. That's uh, my take for tonight. Any other person? Do you have any other thing to say? Was it, is it, is it, was it, was it an exciting topic that we have discussed tonight? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So All right. Praise God. Praise God. All right. Praise God. All right. So you have to uh, read it yourself, you know, and then go through them. And then I believe there will be questions and uh, there will be some actions that you yourself will take if God is called, has called you to this higher call. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Praise God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So let us just thank God for tonight. Let's thank God for His faithfulness. Let's thank God for what He has allowed us to discuss together. Let's pray that this that we have received from the Lord will not be taken away from us.